All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is James Curtis, and I'd like to welcome you back to the second week of our Motor Learning Mondays mini series that I am doing in celebration of Pride Month. Uh, so welcome back. And in this week, we will be talking about augmented feedback. So what is this? Augmented feedback is information about the results and performance of an action that comes from an external source. So oftentimes that's us as the clinician. Augmented feedback is also sometimes called extrinsic feedback or external feedback. Um, and that's because that's in contrast to intrinsic feedback, which is something that we all have anytime we do any sort of movement. So augmented feedback is something that's provided in addition to what we normally get with intrinsic feedback. Um, oftentimes it's provided by the clinician during a therapy session. So anytime we are providing feedback to our patients, we are providing augmented feedback. So what are the types of feedback that we can give our patients? Well, there are two kind of broad categories. We have knowledge of results and then separately knowledge of performance. So knowledge of results um, is feedback information regarding the outcome of an action. It's kind of the end goal. It's kind of the functional outcome. So from a voice perspective, we might be working on a smooth and efficient sounding voice. That's kind of the end product. Um, if we were thinking about something maybe like cough therapy, we're working on um, increasing the effectiveness of someone's cough in someone with dysphagia, we might be working on a strong and crisp cough, right? So those are kind of like the end goals. Knowledge of performance is different. Knowledge of performance is feedback information regarding kind of the movement characteristics of an action. It's kind of the underlying biomechanics that lead to the outcomes or the results. So if we kind of go back to voice, if we're working on a smooth and efficient voice, ee, right, that's, that's our results. Our knowledge of performance would be how we got there. So um, uh, uh, um, information might be something about, all right, we want you to relax your thyroid and muscle. We want you to take a big breath in, use your diaphragm, and give us around 300 milliliters of air per second something like that, right? Much more biomechanical. Um, what do we know from the motor learning literature? Well, typically, not all the time, but typically knowledge of results tends to facilitate greater motor learning than knowledge of performance. As clinicians, I think we are very accustomed to asking people to do things in a very certain way, um, and that's biomechanical kind of instructions and feedback. Um, when in fact, what seems to be better for motor learning for most people, most of the time in most situations is just knowledge of results. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. So it, there's what we call degrees of freedom in any sort of movement. So as an experiment, I could have all of you go ahead and touch your nose. So take your index finger and touch your nose. Okay, so some of you probably touched your nose like this. Some of you might have been more at this angle. Some of you might have kind of like flexed your wrist a little bit more. There's a lot of different ways that you can touch your nose. This is a very classic example in motor learning. And um, there's a really great image of an elderly gentleman who actually kind of like did something like this. So the reality is, is that we can do these tasks in a lot of different ways. And as a clinician, we don't know what's necessarily best for the patient. We don't know what constraints the patient is working with. You know, if it's someone with Parkinson's disease, they might have lots of chest wall rigidity and some tremor. And so the way they're going to most efficiently perform a task might be very different than how you or I perform the task. And so providing knowledge of results just helps someone get to the end of target, which is ultimately what we want in therapy, while they can kind of figure out navigating to that um, most efficient path. Um, but knowledge of performance can be helpful in some situations some of the time. Um, and so let's talk a little bit more about knowledge of performance. We can break knowledge of performance down into two separate categories. We can have descriptive knowledge of performance, so that's kind of another way to provide feedback, and also prescriptive knowledge of performance. So descriptive, descriptive, is a knowledge or performance statement that describes the error that was made. So again, it's providing um, mainly biomechanical information. You might be able to kind of tailor this to knowledge of results, um, describing just what was wrong about it. 
So I do lots of respiratory swallow coordination therapy um, where you know we're working with patients and we're training them to do an exhale, swallow, exhale pattern. And so a descriptive knowledge of performance um, uh, statement might be there, you breathed in, you swallowed, and then breathed out. So you breathed in first, that was what was wrong. Um, Prescriptive knowledge performance is a knowledge of performance statement that describes the error, just like we just talked about, but in addition to that, it adds a statement on how to correct it. So if I go back to my exhale, swallow, exhale pattern, someone breathed in, they swallowed and then breathed out, that's incorrect. If I provided prescriptive knowledge of uh, performance, I might say, there, you breathed in, you swallowed and breathed out. That was wrong. This time, really make sure to breathe out first and then swallow and then keep breathing out. So there I'm telling them exactly what was wrong and also how to fix it. Um, what we know from literature is, uh, again, it's um, uh, it's not the same thing for everybody every, every single time, but the trends seem to be that prescriptive knowledge of performance tends to be better for beginners while descriptive knowledge of performance tends to be better with people who are non-beginners, maybe a little bit more advanced. So that's kind of broadly speaking, the types of augmented feedback that we can provide for our patients. So when providing feedback for patients, we wanna think about the type of feedback that we're giving, but also the timing and the frequency of feedback. So timing, when, when should we give feedback to our patients? Um, well, there's, again, a, a few different things that we can think about in terms of the timing of feedback. We have feedback delay intervals, and we also have post-feedback intervals. So feedback delayed intervals refers to essentially when are we providing the feedback to our patients. So let's say we're providing some sort of knowledge of results. Do we tell them in real time? That would be concurrent feedback. Do we tell them after a trial is completed? Um, that would be called terminal feedback. And if it is terminal, how long are we waiting until we provide that feedback? Do they finish a trial and then we wait a second before we tell them? Do they finish a trial and then we wait five seconds before we tell them? Do they finish a trial and then we wait 10 seconds or a minute before we tell them? Um, it would seem as though slightly longer intervals is seemingly better. Um, again, not all research agrees with this. Some of the older research would suggest tell someone immediately afterwards or concurrent is very good. Um, but kind of the, the newer literature and kind of larger trends of research would seem to suggest that for most people, most of the time, having some sort of interval is good. And that's because it allows the learner, the, the patient, it gives them an opportunity to kind of think through things themselves before relying on any sort of feedback from a clinician. So it gives them a chance to do some error processing and to think critically about what they just did and maybe how they want to fix it. Um, and that's ultimately what we're trying to do, right, is we're trying to facilitate motor learning, not necessarily motor performance. We want them to be um, having a lot of learning going on. So typically allowing for a little bit of a delay, five, 10 seconds, um, is probably sufficient and gives them an opportunity to kind of think through what they just did. We also have that post-feedback interval. And so that's the time between once feedback was given to them, how long until they do their next trial? So do we say that was wrong, there you inhaled first, next time exhale first, and then they go immediately? Or do they wait 10 seconds or a minute before doing that next trial? Um, and again, the literature would suggest that having some sort of interval, whether it's even just a few seconds, is probably better for motor learning because it gives them the, the opportunity to kind of think through the feedback, think through what they thought, and also then plan for that next trial. So they're not just doing something without having plan, planning through it. Um, so typically having some sort of interval regarding the feedback delay interval and also the post feedback interval so the the time between the feedback and the next trial so that 
you know, now we've talked about the type of feedback that we can provide patients. We've talked about the timing of feedback or, or when we provide that feedback, but then also we want to think about how frequently we're giving feedback. So uh, research would suggest um, seemingly that the optimal frequency of augmented feedback is less than every trial. In other words, we should not be providing feedback after every single trial for our patients. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for this. Again, we should be thinking about the fact that we're trying to facilitate motor learning. And so if the patient becomes reliant on us for feedback, then they're not developing their own error processing skills where they're thinking through what they did first um, and instead are having to rely on us. And they're only with us maybe once a week at best. So we want them uh, um, to develop, uh, to, to give them the opportunity to kind of think through things themselves and kind of explore um, and uh, work on their own kind of ability to kind of provide feedback to themselves. So seemingly not every trial is best. There isn't, however, an exact number of how frequently we should or should not give feedback. Um, there's research that have compared every trial to every other trial. There's research that's compared every trial to maybe once every five trials or even every 10 trials. And five to 10 trials is also sufficient for many people. It's important to know that a lot of this motor learning literature though was done in neurologically healthy adults um, where kind of motor learning is relatively intact. Um, so we have to kind of take this with a grain of salt when working with our patient populations, but the concepts still probably translate um, to some extent. Um, so it, you might kind of think about providing feedback after every couple of trials, two, maybe five trials. Um, and more specifically, you can have kind of larger frameworks to guide how frequently you're giving feedback. There's two frameworks I wanna highlight. One is what we call performance-based bandwidth rules. Um, and so with performance-based bandwidth rules, what the clinician is doing is they're coming up with their own kind of rules to kind of figure out, okay, when a patient um, has a certain amount of error, then we will provide feedback. So maybe someone has done three trials that are incorrect in a row. On that first trial, let's provide them feedback. Or maybe um, you've constructed a therapy where you've, um, uh, the therapy is uh, um, uh, broken down into sets of five. Maybe you're doing 50 repetitions and you're doing 10 sets of five. Maybe you're doing something where after every set, if the preceding set was 10% accurate, now we're gonna give feedback after every trial. And once someone achieves 80% accuracy in a given set, then the following sets is, we don't say anything until every five repetitions. So you can come up with performance bandwidth rules based off of the, um, the learner's own accuracy and within a session, adjust. Um, so sometimes it could be after every repetition and then other times it could be after every you know five repetitions, let's say. Um, another framework that you can use is self-selected frequency. So this is where the patient asks for, frequent, uh, asks for feedback on their own and they're not relying and the clinician isn't um, indicating necessarily when they're always providing feedback. So both are two really kind of powerful frameworks for um, uh, guiding the feedback so that as clinicians, we don't feel the need to kind of provide feedback after every trial. And so that's actually what I do in my own therapy sessions is I come up with performance bandwidth rules um, one is actually uh, one that I, I published on in a single subject design. Um, we're coming up with very standardized rules that are specific to the patient, um, but allows the opportunity to maybe provide some extra feedback um, when a patient needs extra scaffolding and then taking that away as soon as possible so we can really kind of help facilitate that learning. Um, one last comment, uh, two last comments. One is the role of biofeedback. So we hear that term all the time. Some of you might question what exactly actually is biofeedback. Um, biofeedback is a specific form of augmented feedback, um, which relies on the use of instrumentation. So it might be patients looking at a computer while they are maybe 
I don't know, speaking or breathing, and they're looking at signals in real time, um, or they're using audio and video recordings. So there's some sort of instrumentation that's being used to help facilitate the biofeedback. And that feedback is providing information probably on, uh, it's probably providing knowledge of performance rather than knowledge of results. So it's providing information and kind of the biomechanics of how movement is being conducted and oftentimes biofeedback is concurrent, meaning it's um, there's no delay, it's happening immediately. But some forms of biofeedback might be um, uh, terminal uh, augmented feedback. So, um, kind of in conclusion, remember that we as speech language pathologists are really trying to facilitate optimal motor learning, not necessarily motor performance. Um, so again, uh, we shouldn't necessarily sweat the small stuff if a patient is demonstrating low accuracy. What we're doing is we're providing opportunities for them to kind of think through things themselves um, and providing feedback as needed as a scaffold for them to become more independent. Um, I hope you enjoyed it this week and I look forward to seeing you all next week. Take care. Bye-bye.